Just want you to know I've already failed tonight. We usually try to have a number of the folks at community meetings. When we, uh, <laughs> we did not achieve that tonight. That's which is great news. Um, uh, it's it's always good to see a good turnout um, at community meetings because it's really how we get a lot of things done and how we understand and how we connect. Um, one of the things I the well, main reason I wanted to speak tonight, and I thank you so much, Reverend Fleming, for uh, giving me some time uh, to talk about an important issue really of policing and police community relationships all around the country, and that is the use of body cameras. Uh, many of you know, uh, or, or, or should know anyway, that the state passed a law last year. Um, I had some involvement with shaping some of the language in that law. Uh, however, I believe it was um, Senator Pinckney who introduced the initial legislation around body cameras uh, back um, a while before he was shot and killed in Charleston. And um, part of the part of the legislation was to deal with how how do we how do we improve trust? How do we uh, manage the police community conflict that we see from time to time uh, on the streets as officers are doing their jobs and as citizens are going about their business uh, in our communities? We're members of the public, everybody is in the citizen. Uh, but uh, there is conflict around the country. And I knew, um, in spite of Ferguson, I believe the bill was filed right after the Ferguson incident, but uh, it was really kind of stuck in committee, not going anywhere. And I knew after the North Charleston incident, uh, which was uh, uh, really, in, in my estimation, uh, a significant event, that the body camera bill would be law. Uh, and so at that point, you do your best to try and really shape it. I believe in body cameras. I implemented them in Greensboro uh, among 508 road employees. Uh, so there, it's not new to me. Um, and so I was a supporter, actually, of the legislation. However, uh, there are many concerns and things that people do not understand about body cameras that can create more conflict and more problems uh, if you don't address them either in the statute such as the release of information. A lot of people want to see the video uh, and understand what took place. The problem is is that video may be inside your home. It may be maybe filming your your personal belongings, your very personal and private spaces. And yet an incident may go down inside a home. We may just have a, a call to an open door and a alarm call. And we see an open door and we go in your home. We're going to check every closet. We're going to check under beds. We're going to check everywhere. And we may encounter somebody and it may be a situation and the claims are one thing against police. We really want the blueprint of your home and all your belongings out there for the public to consume. And I think the answer is no. And ultimately, those were some of the questions that the legislature had to deal with that were very, very difficult uh, to grapple with. And so ultimately, they protected all, all of the records with very few exceptions um, in terms of the body camera records. Uh, however, they did give police and sheriffs and solicitors the authority to release uh, video uh, as, as needed to manage relationships, the, basically the police community relationship, and to deal with issues as they come up. Now I can tell you in North Carolina law, I dealt with this square on in Greensboro because had I released video without the council, the city council taking a vote, I would have been committing a misdemeanor. Committing a misdemeanor would have been violating my oath of office. Now, I will tell you that the newspaper, everybody wanted me to commit that misdemeanor. But I knew as soon as I did, they would tell everybody how I violated my oath of office and I violated the law intentionally and I was no better than anybody else that we were locking up and violating the law. So I, I wouldn't do it. And I only did it in one case where we had uh, council approval to do it. Um, and that created tension and it creates suspicion. Uh, so South Carolina, I think, was uh, insightful in allowing us, and it's something we requested, but insightful in allowing us uh, that discretion uh, to release video because it enables me um, to address 
uh, issues of concern to you uh, about police community contacts uh, as they occur. And so there are a number of things that the law provided for, including the fact that we had to come up with a policy that gets approved by the Criminal Justice Training Council, uh, South Carolina Criminal Justice Training Council in Columbia. We've submitted a draft policy to them. Uh, that policy was the culmination of a review of policies around the country, including uh, what are considered the best practice materials out there that identify best practices uh, with uh, respect to body camera policy development. All of that material is on our website. All of our re reference material, our, our uh, policies that we look to uh, to shape this policy, and then hearing, getting feedback from individuals, not only members of our city council, uh, but also within the police department operationally, the things we need, um, and from community meetings. We've also got in the, on the web page an opportunity for people to review documents and submit suggestions online to us regarding our policy. And we've received a few suggestions. Mostly those suggestions are, this is a good idea, um, or, you know, I like it, or um, something along that line. But there, there have been a couple of constructive uh, points, mostly centered around release. And uh, most people want the video to be available on demand to the public. And unfortunately, we can't do that because we would have multiple people tied up full time in redaction processes, basically trying to blur out everybody's personal belongings and private space and blurring out faces and tags and everything else. So it, it's very complicated. So there is some level of uncharted water or territory we're going into with this law and uh, implementing these for the first time here in Greenville. Uh, but we have a policy developed, we've submitted it to the state for approval in accordance with the guidelines that they've set forth. And it's still draft, so we're still taking input on this policy. But ultimately, and I'm going to talk through a few provisions of the policy, and we have copies in the back, so you're welcome to take it with you, read it, uh, call us, ask, call me, ask questions, submit comments online or in person or via the phone. We're happy to take the comments. Um, my goal is that our police department serves you honestly, faithfully, and treats you with dignity and respect. What I can also tell you is that everybody doesn't want to have contact with a police officer, even when they must. And so we have people who resist our lawful authority. And when you resist our lawful authority, it becomes a problem. And it's going to result in force, and force, no matter how simple it is, doesn't look good. It's a physical exertion where somebody is struggling against another person. People fall, people get scuffed up, people get hurt. And we don't want to resort to force, and we are we're reshaping our use of force policy, we've reshaped training, we're continuing to mold and modify to the environment we're in, the world we're in, the climate we're in. But what I can tell you is that we have to continue to work, not only to improve on our end, but to imp improve the community response uh, to us doing our work. And so in, in that regard, it can never be okay to resist an officer who's lawfully doing his or her job. And there are many avenues of redress that folks can use. You can complain to internal affairs if you don't trust that process. You can complain to the Fire and Police Practices Commission, which is independent of us. You can complain to a council member who would ensure a, a, an unbiased and a fair and thorough investigation were completed. Those are all administrative side. If you feel we've assaulted or committed a criminal violation, you can appeal to SLED or the solicitor to do an independent investigation. You can also pursue through Department of Justice a civil rights violation claim against the department. And you can also sue civil 
for harm or damages that you feel you've incurred as a result of a police contact or unlawful or inappropriate police conduct. So there are many, many remedies that are established, well established in law, not just for police and community interactions, but for all conflicts to be settled peacefully. Um, unfortunately, the place to settle those are not on the street when the officer is trying to do his or her job. At the same time, we don't want our officers overstepping their boundaries. We don't want them overstepping the law. We don't want them abusing people, their rights, or their persons. We won't accept it. We won't tolerate it. We know that we're in a climate now where oftentimes there's not video, or where there is video that's sketchy, it's not complete, doesn't answer all the questions. One's pending right now. They're in the same situation. Body cameras will help us with that, but they're not the answer to our, our problems. The answer to our problems are to obey the law, are to obey the authority of a police officer exerting the law, and to use the law to, to redress wrongful acts of police. And that keeps the peace in our communities. So um, as we go through the, with, with body camera implementation, and we will be making a presentation to the city council uh, at their work session on February 16th on body cameras, our use of force policy revisions, and a few other items. Um, we, have, we were successful in securing the federal grant for $93,750 uh, to implement body cameras in the department. The body camera program will cost a lot more than that. The initial implementation uh, will be about $300,000. And the annual installation, uh, but it's also important, and it's, a, it's what we believe, I think the city manager believes, I think many members of city council, I know I believe, it's a must have in, in, our, in our environment today. And so we're trying to do this right, we're trying to do it well, um, and trying to be able to demonstrate that either we're right or address it where we're wrong very quickly. Um, because the people I work with are people who care about you, and care about the reputation of this organization, and care about the reputation of the city, and we don't want to spoil it. Uh, it doesn't mean we won't have somebody who makes a bad, an error in judgment, who uses bad judgment, or somewhere along the line we've hired somebody with a bad heart. Uh, but it will help us weed through those much, much faster. And so I do think it will be helpful. Um, sir, what, so what do we require with our policy? I mean, it's I don't know, eight pages, seven and a half pages long, and says when you're supposed to use them and under what circumstances we release them, how we audit them. And the bottom line is, is if, if we, we want to encourage interaction, we don't want to spoil it. And if we record every encounter with every human being we, we have, we might as well run these things day in and day out, and the cost will even go up from there. And it will drive away people from communicating with us. So there are, there are certain conditions we require, uh, video footage and other conditions where we don't. So, Generally, if you just come up and you want to have a conversation with the officer and you want to talk about those great new bike uniforms we have or you know, you're asking directions or you just have a question about policing in general. It's not a recorded conversation. We don't want our folks doing that. Um, we think it suppresses that kind of interaction. But anything that we do that is investigative in nature, we're going to record. And the people who will wear them are going to be our field operational uniformed personnel. So that's not just patrol officers who are assigned to patrol the different zones around the city, the five zones. It's also our traffic units. It's also our K-9. It's also our, our crime response team officers, many of whom already wear them. They wear the ones right here, which are really insufficient. Um, they kind of clip on. And and what they're going to do 
is be required to record those investigative interactions. So if I have a call for service and I respond on that call, we're going to be recording. So the call's stable. If it's an emergency call, a shooting situation, a robbery, whatever, until we have a situation stable and we're basically waiting for detectives or forensics to come on scene, we're going to be running film. Film is an old term now. But we're going to be running memory. Um, but, but, the, but the bottom line is, is, is we're going to be recording and, and so once it's stable and secure then the supervisor, the ranking officer will say we're done, everybody cut your cameras, we're stable. Purpose is, is when things are chaotic anything can happen. And so when anything can happen, situations and they're not stable and secure, um, they can appear relatively stable and immediately um, go off go off the deep end and we're likely not then to have video. So uh, anything investigative, if we stop somebody in a car, if we stop somebody walking, even if it's a voluntary contact, meaning you don't want to stop for me and you're walking down the street and I want to walk alongside of you and try and engage in conversation, that's legal. Stopping you without reason when you don't want to stop is not it without a lawful reason to detain you is not legal so voluntary would be me walking with you but I'm looking for something in, in terms of a criminal investigation then I need to be recording that when we search people when we search homes uh, when we exercise high-risk entries we think there's an armed person inside and we're gonna we're gonna ram a door and go in like a drug raid or something. We need to be running video. Okay. That captures the critical incidents where one, people are surprised by police sometimes, or the interaction is most likely uh, to result in some conflict, some physical conflict. Um, so so that there, there's a whole list of of particular situations, but ultimately it boils down to if it's investigative in nature, we're going to record it. Um, when it comes to uh, release of video, I, I, I just want to read an excerpt from the policy because I won't remember every attribute that we have to consider and every factor that we have to balance. But in, pay, in section 10, which is near the end, there is a a section titled Retention, Release, and Viewing of Recordings. And I, I, just, I, I just want you to listen. Decisions regarding retention, release, and viewing of recordings can be the most controversial and important post-incident actions taken by the department. While body-worn camera footage, we call BWC, body-worn camera footage, is not a public record subject to di disclosure under the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act, Oftentimes, public confidence and trust will hinge upon the release of records and video in a highly charged environment. Police and community interests include maintaining public trust, protecting the integrity of investigation. In other words, you could put video out there too soon, and then you're still looking for witnesses, and then all of a sudden, magically, witnesses materialize who were never there because you have every angle covered, they can pretty much make up a story that they saw and what they didn't see. Um, so protecting the integrity of investigation, maintaining public trust, the state's ability to prosecute fairly, not just a, a member of the public, but a police officer. Fairness to our employees, they're asked to do a tough job, and when they're doing the right things, we need to support them. And when we don't support them, we failed as a community and I failed as a chief. I won't support illegal or, or wrongful conduct, but when my officers are doing the right thing and it's tough, I'm gonna to stand by them every time. They expect me to, you need me to. Um, so protecting our employees, protecting the privacy interests of the public we serve, and serving the public's right to know. So when the requests come in, I'm gonna be looking at those factors. So there's no secret, there's no mystery to the different factors that we need to examine as a police department. 
those are the factors we're going to look at. We're going to try and strike the right balance. So in the most recent complaint that we've had, an allegation, we did not release the video last week. We released the records. We released the video this week. Some people are taking issue with the video. I don't see anything at issue in the video. Um, but there are, so we got questions about the video at this point. And so, but we, what we tried to do was delay the release of the video because we're still looking to identify witnesses to the offense. When we could no longer identify them, we released it. We've since identified the witnesses. So we're trying to protect the integrity of the case. So these are the factors that we'll consider in reviewing uh, the when and how we release video. I have seen mistakes in releasing video. And I have, I've, you know, I'm, I don't like to question what other decisions or other decisions in other jurisdictions are, um, but I would have released the video in the Seneca incident much sooner. And I would have handled the whole situation differently. But that's me. I can't speak for the political pressure or anything, any other pressure that the solicitor, the police chief, or anybody else was under in Seneca. I'm not privy to all that information. So I don't stand in judgment. I just know I would have done differently. Because I think community trust erodes. And my concern about what happens, and the only reason I speak about Seneca, or about Cleveland, or about New York, or any of the other incidents, is because we're all painted with the same brush. What happened in Chicago, people look at us and they think we're the same. We don't train like Chicago, we don't behave like Chicago, and I will accept that kind of behavior. Individual was charged and was appropriately so. Cleveland, I don't understand how he didn't get charged. I just don't. Somebody else is closer to the facts than me. Uh, but those incidents affect us here locally. And so we're at a point now where really body cameras are a must have in our, in our environment so that we can begin to better explain and understand the nature and the context of the interactions of our officers and members of the public. They've got a hard job to do because they have to make decisions based on things that they see, that they hear, that they feel instantaneously and we stand back for weeks or months sometimes even years, judging. It's not simple. And when we, and, and there are things we're doing in addition. We have a Citizens Academy coming up. We, we could fit 30 people in it. We have six applications. It's been out for a month. We're trying to get applications for people to come in and understand how we're put together, things that we do, things that we don't do. We recently uh, got approval from the city council. Thank you. Council member. It's council member now. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Fleming. <laughs> but um, uh, for approving funding to purchase a um, uh, uh, firearms training simulator so that we can work not only with our own folks, uh, but also members of the public to understand the decision making processes that officers have to go through. It's important for us to be sensitive to your perspectives. It's also important for you to understand how we're put together, because you, we're your police department. And to understand why we do things in the manner we do. And I can tell you that most people that go through that, and they often shoot when they shouldn't. And our officers are people too, and there are times when they fear. And we don't understand that when we're removed from the, the situation necessarily. But at the same time, we can't abuse people's fundamental human rights and their dignity. And we won't tolerate it. None of the folks in this room will accept it. And the people I know in the organization, unless they're concealing it well, nobody in our organization will. But everybody doesn't believe that. So we want to continue to work with you. We want to continue to inspire your trust and your confidence in us uh, as we work to improve our policies, our training, our operations, and our engagement with you. But we also ask that you're patient, you understand, and you seek to learn more about us. 
because that's the bridge. And that's how we weather the storm that's really overtaken the nation, I think, at this point. So I don't know if anybody has any questions about the body cameras, about the policy. We didn't send it out in advance. Um, again, there, there are 25 copies, I think, on the back, or 24 copies in the back. Um, so you're welcome to take one with you, and we certainly welcome your comments and your feedback on the policy. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. We'll, we'll, I mean, anybody who wants my number, uh, Sheila Dorn's number, we're, we're, I mean, we're, or if you have online access, you go to our website. If you're looking at our webpage, there's a little square rec or rectangle box with like a camera lens on it. It says Body One Camera Project. Click on that, and there's a form that you can click on and, and just fill in your, your comments about the policy. Um, but, but you can contact us either way. We're happy to give you our number. And, um, we take all the comments seriously, and we've made a couple of adjustments to the policy to accommodate it. Uh, one person felt we should make all I think we're posting those comments also online, or at least we're aggregating them to post them at a later point. But one person made a comment that we should, we should make public all video. Well, we can't do that. Um, the law doesn't permit that. So, but, but we're trying to balance that interest um, in a very fair and responsible way. Yes, sir. How many officers will get the cameras, and where do you expect it to be well, rolled out? Okay, so um, roll out and who gets the cameras, or how many? Uh, so our grant was for 125 officers. When you add in supervisors, and we've done kind of the hard count, it's 139, because okay, our frontline supervisors would also get them. So um, it's, a, uh, it's 139 officers. We have 197 total sworn. Uh, we will not put them on vice detectives because that's kind of a dead giveaway um, when you're in an undercover capacity. Um, but, but in any event, a lot of times, you know, they'll set up remote cameras to record a, a drug deal or something like that anyway. Um, but um, our rollout schedule uh, initially was the March time frame. It's probably going to be April, May, probably more likely May. There are two factors affecting that. Um, one, we're working through uh, some of the procurement processes and the, uh, the, the, the budget review processes internally. Uh, right now, in terms of where's the money come from, how are we piecemealing it together, what are our recommendations going to be to the city council. and. <coughs> And then uh, the procurement process is also going to uh, not only bring in the body cameras, but it's going to bring in uh, the new smart weapon taser electronic control devices. Okay. Many of our, many of our, you, you know them as tasers, the things we get jacked up on with electricity. <laughs> um, I, I've, I've borne that five times. I'll probably get a sixth one here this year sometime. But it hurts and then it's over. Um, and, and so many of our devices are beyond five years old. The manufacturer says you need a replacement five years. We have no recurring funding in our budget for replacement tasers. We have no recurring funding in our budget for in-car cameras, many of them are approaching eight, eight and a half years and, and really aren't serviceable. We have a real hard time keeping them in service. So this program that we're, it will give us new taser devices and it's it's a taser brand uh, body camera. It will either be up here on the shoulder, collar, or head mount. And the, the, when, the problem with body cameras and one of the big faults we see with them is with a, with a car camera, when you turn on the blue lights, you turn on the siren, the camera automatically starts recording. They can even start recording just based on speed alone, speed thresholds.
Body cameras aren't that way. And so they require manual activation. Well, if things kick off suddenly, or I'm trying to fumble for equipment or whatever, I might not remember to hit the button until later. So what we, what we were trying to do was find a manufacturer that actually can, can minimize that risk of no record in a, in a record required environment. So Taser is the only one that when you, that when, because they're made by the same company, that when you activate, when you turn on the emergency or the electrical device, it activates the body camera. They're just, just now bringing that technology to market. In addition, they're the only ones that enable us to Bluetooth certain 12 volt functions from the car to activate the camera. So it doesn't require officer intervention. So that could be, Pressing the shotgun release button uh, can be turned on the blue lights, the siren, um, any one of a number of, of functions in the car. Uh, we have the <coughs> remote door pops, like for K9, you hit the remote door pop, and it, if you're close enough in the Bluetooth range, it would activate the camera. So we're trying to minimize the no record environment. So that requires us really to go with one vendor because there's only one vendor on the market that can do that. They're coming out with a new camera in a month or two, I think Joe is, well, they're saying they're coming out with a new camera. It has greater storage, longer battery life. Our folks work 12-hour shifts. Current battery life is at 8 to 10 hours of record time. Now, they won't be recording constantly, but there could be a period where somebody's battery chokes out and we're missing video. So the longer record uh, capabilities, the longer battery life, um, and then there's some other features that are built into that. So that may push us back a couple of months. If it pushes us back too long, we're just going to go with the existing technology. So we're, we're sometime April, May. I know that's long, but I just, I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to put it all out. Yeah. So no surprises for anybody. Um, what cameras don't do. I, what they do do, other than record, you know, and provide independent view of an event, is um, I think generally they improve the behavior of people on both sides of the camera. I think generally. Not always, because I've watched it. Um, prior assignment, I've seen it uh, on both sides. But mostly, I think, uh, there is evidence out there in some departments. I still think nobody's done real, a real rigorous, or I think it requires a longitudinal study. But complaints went down in Greensboro, complaints went down in Rialto, uh, California, which is probably the study that's cited the most. Um, complaints went down, Sheila, you sent me one. Where? Oakland. Oakland. Um, so, uh, Hopefully they'll go down here, and uh, or we'll be able to resolve them much more quickly. And but what they don't do, what cameras don't do, uh, is guarantee that people are going to do what's right. They just don't guarantee that, and and they don't guarantee that somebody is not going to um, challenge the officer. They don't, guarantee that the officer is not going to make a mistake. Uh, but they will help us address those issues very quickly. Any other questions? Speak now if they have a whole new piece. I have to you out. Yes. Oh, one more. Yes, sir. The uh, public clash you were talking about, we only had six uh, people signed up for. The police? How, how long is that clash? And, well, it starts February 9th. And we're revising the curriculum, make it more interactive than lecture. So our instructor is going to have some work to do between now and then. Runs through May 3rd. It's on Thursday nights. Two to two and a half hours. We're going to try and keep them to two hours, six to eight. However, um, sometimes when you're in the interactive pieces, uh, you might run a little bit longer. So we ask people to plan for two and a half hours. Um, but our goal is, is, to, is to be succinct but engaging and let you see different facets and aspects of the police department uh, and experience, uh, and not just our police department, but 
you know, the, the county provides the bomb squad uh, capabilities for the, really the, the, the entire county. And you should understand, you know, the functions and the equipment and the processes that they use there. Uh, so there's just, and forensics is Greenville County, so that's your crime scene, but they'll work with our detectives and train you on forensics and crime scene investigation, and then we'll put together a mock crime scene that folks will work through. Uh, we'll have the shoot, don't shoot. We'll do traffic stop scenarios so you can see uh, how, how easy it is to be taken advantage of or um, uh, how to protect yourself and how we try to protect ourselves um, and, and, and still manage a situation so everybody's safe. Ultimately, we train for safety uh, and, and problems, uh, but we can't always control every factor. So it, it gives you that exposure. So February, and you can get online on our webpage, look for Police Citizens, uh, Greenville Police Citizens Academy, GPCA. The application's there, the new schedule's posted, it's on our Facebook as well, it was posted today, uh, the new schedule, and you know, we'd love to fill up that class, I'd, I'd love to, I, I don't know that I'd turn people away unless I hit probably more than 40, everybody will cry about that, but I, I just think <laughs> the more the merrier. Do you do that once a year or? Right now, once a year, uh, we are going to do a high school academy in conjunction with Furman's uh, Bridges program uh, in Greenville County Schools um, in late July. So it'll be a 20-hour program uh, in a one-week period. So um, for the kids, and again, interactive, focus on interactive and, and understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, sir. Thank you. to get to the Citizen Academy, and so it, has, it is now available to us. I would like for all of the West Greenberg members to, West Greenberg Community Association members, I'd like for every one of you to go to that Citizen Academy. Uh, 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 Chief, I think we probably need to have, can, can, can people who've been through the Academy uh, go there? Because you have, you have expanded the uh, information and based on all the stuff you you're doing a whole lot more than they have done in the past in the Citizen Academy. It's mostly been lecture in the past um, and with some interactives. Uh, we're trying to make it more, there's going to be lecture because you have to learn about how we do things, but we are trying to make it much more interactive. If you have interest in coming through, I'd say apply. Mm -hmm.